uh, welcome to this uh, master class. I will be speaking on this uh, endoscopic necrosectomy. As we all know, as a part of endoscopic drainage procedure, endoscopic necrosectomy is an important uh, step which may sometimes be required for drainage of pancreatic fluid collections. In this talk, I would be covering the prerequisites, the devices used for DEN, the use of DEN in both plastic or metal stent, how to do it, how to tackle adverse events if they happen to occur, and what is the future in this DEN. So, when do we consider DEN? It's straightforward. Whenever the collection is infected, that is a patient who did not have fever and has developed a new onset fever after drainage or the patient who was already infected and fails to improve after index drainage. There are some prerequisites for DEN. It's a very unpredictable and a time consuming procedure and each case is unique on its own. So you have to treat on merit. It can fail at times and that's when we have to keep our egos low. We should avoid avoidable complications. It's grammatically incorrect but a very important statement, do not overdo the procedure at endoscopic necrosectomy for the risk of bleed and perforations and if they happen to occur, be ready for the next step. You can always come back later and that's why we need to do a step by step rather than too much at one time and be relaxed because this, tape, this procedure is said time consuming and you have to give sufficient time and there should be no lined up procedure after the, this den. The armamentarium that we have to keep ready is a regular endoscopy which is required with a water pump, carbon dioxide for insufflation, fluoroscopy is always useful and the devices that are commonly used are braided snare, foreign body forceps, baskets or baskets with nets. These are several devices which are borrowed from the endoscopy tool for ERCP or foreign body removals and one of the important devices over here is a Roth net. Let's move forward. Then can be required in patients who have undergone a plastic or a metal stent earlier and if the symptoms demand then we consider the endoscopic necrosectomy. So let's go one by one. So what is the step up approach for direct endoscopic necrosectomy? First is to declog any dead tissue or debris which is blocking the fistula that you have created between the stomach <clears> and <throat> the, uh, the cavity of one. And declogging is generally required for metal stent placed, but sometimes it can also be required in patients who had upfront plastic stents. The second step which we consider in our unit is to use a liberal use of nasocystic tube and this is meant for external irrigation. In this, we use 100 ml of saline as bolus every 8 hourly and this is done for 2 or 3 days between the several sessions. So each session is done on few <laughs> days apart during which this patient undergoes a saline flush. Use of hydrogen peroxide is little controversial. Some people like it and if used, it should be used in 3% freshly available hydrogen peroxide in amount of 10 to 20 cc and this should be done at least 15 minutes before the intended saline lavage. Never mix saline with hydrogen peroxide. And then we come to the DEN proper which I will discuss in the subsequent slides. <coughs> All these steps Sequential steps can also be sometimes combined in one session. For example, declogging along with the third step that is DEN proper. Let's go to the plus patients who have plastic stent placed. Mind you, these patients have a higher risk of perforation compared to those with metal stents because there is no covered stent preventing the, uh, uh, the, the risk of leak or perforation. Always remove one stent and keep at least one stent so that you, that will be your target by which beside which you can go inside the cavity. And before entering the cavity, if you have placed an upfront plastic stent, sometimes the fistula collapses and that's why we need to dilate it at least 15 millimeters. Some people also prefer 18 to 20, but my personal preference is 15 millimeters. The other devices that we can use 
uh, while doing a den with a plastic scent in situ is also a roth net or whichever accessory which you are familiar with or is required in that patient. It all depends on how the debris is placed, whether it is loose or adherent, whether it is next to the blood vessel. All these things make a huge difference in deciding which device to choose to continue the process. Place, whether it is loose or adherent, whether it is next to the blood vessel, all these things make a huge difference in deciding which device to choose to continue the process. And sometimes this debris can be can be left inside the stomach or if the big chunk comes out, you can actually pull out the scope and re-intubate the patient. By intubation, I mean the patient is generally in conscious sedation under propofol sedation, uh, but if required and uh, if the unit demands, you can do under general CCI with endotracheal intubation as well. So here you can see several devices have been used, started with basket, now a snare is being used and you can use forceps also. So, blend of devices should be available in the unit and here is a pronged device. So, moving forward in patients with plastic send the first session is always drainage only with plastic and as in nasocystic tube if required. Then in second session which is done two or three days after the first session based on symptoms at this time we do debridement after dilatation mm -hmm. and third session again uh, can be done. Uh, gaps of two or three days, but each session you have to replace the plastic stent or NCT if you require because irrigation is an important part of the treatment of endoscopic necrosectomy. So metal stents are cur currently a preferred stents and there are several types. They are in broad family of large caliber metal stent or LCMS. In that we have lamps which is lumen opposing metal stent which includes axios and spaxis and bi flank metal stent which includes Nagi and other stents similar. And that is how they look like in endoscopy view. Uh, the one in the center and on the right are the lamps, the spaxes and axios, where on the left is a bi flanged and as you can see on the image, uh, the adherence is much less and that is why risk of migration occurs. Coming to the first step which is we often consider if the position is like this, where the debris is occluding the lumen of the metal stent. You can just gently tease it out with a snare and that itself solves most of the problem if the inner cavity is clean and no more loose debris inside. Another example is where declogging is now combined with a necrosectomy. Again a similar looking debris but a larger piece which is extending inside the cavity and it is not coming out easily, so you make adjustments, catch the, the largest chunk of the tissue even if you have to push it out a little bit and then drag it out very gently rotating the scope sometimes so that it kind of uh, uh, comes out through the stent. Often if a large chunk comes out, it also takes out the metal stent with it and that is how to do and tackle that we can discuss in subsequent slides. The second step is if there is no <clears throat> decognitive required or you have finished with it and you find that lot of debris and infection is there in the cavity, then you place a nasocystic tube maybe at the same sitting of the first uh, session. It is generally 6 to 7 caliber tube and the tip should be placed deep inside the cavity because we want the, the irrigating solution to flush out as much as possible. It should not be very close to the tip of the inner end of the stent. And then we come to the direct endoscopic necrosectomy. In this, the accessory is passed inside the cavity with or without the scope. That means either the accessory goes in or the scope with the accessory goes inside the cavity. As you see it here, in this panel, you can see pus coming out and debris inside, but the scope is still outside the stent or just at the mouth of the stent. But we can still, by visualizing the debris, we can pull it out. And there are several in and out movement which happen as you can see in this uh, video. Another patient which has uh, a, a debris which is blocking the scent, so first you declog it, 
and my preferred uh, de device is a braided snare you catch it and pull it out but it's such a big one that you can see the struggle which is happening in even this edited video that the debris is not coming out on easily but once you take it out you see a big chunk has come out then you go inside and see the stent has moved out from its place it's lying in the in this gastric cavity and you see the pus copious amount of pus coming from the cavity so first thing is take out this stent and then you do the further procedures with a simple rat tooth or any foreign body forceps which is then now cleaned and kept externally you can go back inside with the same endoscope inside the cavity inspect it well lavage and irrigate with saline suck out the loose debris which can be done and you can see blood vessels inside the large big blood vessels inside and one has to avoid which i'll see in, show in next videos so what are the advantages that large caliber metal stents offer they are covered and prevent leak and perforation because of the design they have reduced migration and reintervention can be done through the stents but there are some drawbacks as well let's see bleeding we know can happen when the cyst collapses and the back wall of the cyst or the far end of the cyst comes and rubs against it it can also occur during necrosectomy because those vessels are now now closer and sometimes they can be hidden from your view because of the obscuring debris migrations can happen during the den both it can go inside the cavity or external migration into the lumen and sometimes they can hinder the den the 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 debris can go around the uh, the the inner flange and is not easily reachable by the endoscope in such situations probably you have to remove the stent so that you can do a perfect job of necrosectomy some of the events which are unexpected can happen and how do we tackle them so let's show some of the procedures so this is a stent which had migrated inside at the previous session of of uh, necrosectomy but when we came for the second session we saw that the den had gone the stent had migrated inside and then we have to dilate this fistless opening with a balloon and then catch the stent gently with the edge if you can see it and tease it out lo and behold you can always reposition the stent back to its original position as was intended so that's internal migration what about external migration also this can occur when you see a debris which is so large and adherent and you suck the whole debris chunk comes uh, into the view but when you do necrosectomy it's only piece peel actually nibbling on a very large uh, piece of cake and nothing is going to come out and these are the ones which are uh, where you can probably leave them off they are time consuming and probably not very rewarding also as you see the stent has migrated external down to the lumen and bleedings can happen as you see it here this is a stent in a very awkward position so necrosectomy could not be done and not so also occluding the uh, the debris was occluding the stent and we now no way to enter it so once we removed it the stent now we go inside and see that the large chunk of debris is peeping out of the fistula and you can grab it well and then pull the whole thing out and then we go back in inspect the cavity you see some more debris which is loose and very minimally or partially adherent which can easily be now removed pus is there which can be irrigated and you can see large big blood vessels with infected blood tissue infected tissue in between those one has to be very careful when you do it and bleeds like this can happen it's obscuring the view and you're also anxious that whether it's an artery or a vein but the ooze suggests it's likely to be vein but whether it's going to stop or not so we keep ob observing this bleed and uh, irrigating uh, in between to see what's happening after about 5 minutes of constant observation and flushing we start seeing that the bleeding is now reducing in intensity and spontaneously stops so never rush into clipping these big vessels you don't know what they are what they are feeding they are the branch of the splenic vein or uh, or near the hilum or they actually the artery 
arterial bloods you can always see spurting out and this is an example of an arterial bleed which you can see inside and then uh, uh, people who have a uh, lot of guts gastroenterologists with guts go inside and put clips on these blood vessels personally i am a little against it i would prefer to ask my ir colleagues to bail me out from this situation but nevertheless it all depends on how things are available in the center that we are doing one important thing i thought i'd like to show is replacement of an externally migrated nagi stent for this we just required a regular upper gi scope and a foreign body forcep so this is ex vivo through the endoscope the forcep comes you squeeze the stent after cleaning it well of the same patient that has come out during necrosectomy pull it back inside the channel of the scope and then this loaded stent is not taken inside you're just going with a forward wing endoscope with the stent just inside the channel you see the it's a very healthy granulation tissue inside and then you gently push it out the forceps so the inner flange opens inside the cavity pulling back the scope you can reposition and place the stent in the original place and now you can continue in see, seeing inside so this is a healthy granulation tissue which i am looking at there is some debris on the right side but that's minimal so once you see this that's probably your end point of necrosectomy this topic would be incomplete if i don't discuss dr pramod garg's paper of percutaneous endoscopic necrosectomy where percutaneous tubes are placed for uh, which is very commonly done but these uh, tracks are not so wide so you can dilate with a large caliber balloon or sometimes people use a fully covered metal stents like esophageal stents through which we can go and then drag these debris out so you place the endoscope you can pass the endoscope through this track and go inside the cavity and plug it out what are the future i'll spend next two slides on this there is another device which has come called as endo rotor or interscope which is like a rotor ablator which is used by a cardiologist and this device rotates and causes uh, uh, inside and kind of uh, uh, causes necrosectomy just by touching that the hard debris as you can see there it has a suction at one end through the hollow lumen which takes it uh, sucks the tissue back and also kind of peels it or nibbles it off but one has to be very careful although it's found to be safe in early experience but only time would tell whether blood vessel injury can occur or not the next device is an excavator from ovesco which is an a device which is assembly which is fitted to the tip of the endoscope it's mainly outside it's put like a cap at the tip and once it had fitted well the external sheath is taped to the endoscope and then this whole assembly is taken inside so at several levels of the endoscope tapes is put and once it is loaded on the endoscope the endoscopic view looks like this it's a transparent hood which the two flaps can open up as you can see it here we had a recent experience with this endoscope with the transparent hood goes inside it can go inside the through the stent into the cavity and once inside the cavity you open up like a forcep so it's a big flange which opens up and you can see through the transparent hood here you see it's opened up and with suction you can grasp the tissue inside the the flanges of the excavator and then pull it out once in the stomach you can open the flange again and flush it out and this can be done several times if the chunk is big it can be pulled out of the endoscope of the mouth of the patient and large chunks can then be delivered ex vivo as well this is how it would look like in the end so in the end i would like to conclude by saying that then should be considered in patients based on symptoms choose right accessories be patient in your approach and stop when healthy granulation tissue is seen thank you very much for your kind attention